I um, was intrigued to get to come and speak to a very diverse audience. Usually I'm just speaking to educators or very angry parents, so it's nice to have a, um, a great group. Um, leadership is from the classroom to the boardroom. I know when people say leadership, they think just principles, but um, I'm going to talk about how turnaround schools turned around, and it was all about from students to county commissioners even. Um, everyone is a leader, and we hope for good. Um, sometimes we have allowed those not good leaders to take the stage when really we should be celebrating those leaders who are doing good things for children. Um, I start with the 90-90-90 schools and those turnaround schools. Now this is just a tiny list. I have three books full of case studies that I share with my students. Um, I start with Brazoport, Texas. Um, Mitch asked me, how do parents or how do people get started with this? Brazoport, underrepresented population parents, Hispanic, African American, Asian parents, not Asian, but those uh, Hispanic and African American, went to the school board and said, our stu students are performing at 44%. White students are performing at 75%. Why? And he said, that will change. And in five years, they close the achievement gap. Students close the achievement gap because they declared Brazoport, Texas schools free of gangs. Now, that was student leadership. So each of these has its own story, and these are just a partial list. I do want to share our own personal story in Johnston County. I was telling Mitch we were like 115 out of 119 in achievement, and we got a superintendent who had a vision of excellence, and he instilled that vision of excellence in us as principals, and we instilled that vision of excellence in our teachers and our teachers and our students. And we went from 114 or 115, very bottom of the state, to right up at the top in five years, just, and in 10 years, we did not have a substandard building in Johnston County. But I want to share, last year, we had two schools make 100% on the Math 1 test. Now, we have schools that have 10, maybe 15% underrepresented population, 17, 20% poverty. Those were not the schools that achieved 100%. Selma and Smithfield Middles, those two very dark, very poor schools. In fact, Selma only had one white student in its population until a leader, a community leader, Dr. Dickie Perry said, I'm going to put my grandchildren in Selma Elementary. And now the school has about 20% Caucasian and about 80% underrepresented population. And those are the students that made 100% on Math 1. That's Algebra, for those of you who aren't familiar with the new term, that's the old algebra that ha has moved into the eighth grade. So, these are the, when I read case studies, I try to look at things that come in common. What were the things that all of them had that were the same? High expectations, collaboration, love, and integrity. I, I stress integrity and, and to do a little bird walk. I served on the committee to do the standards for the new <coughs> principles, it's called the executive standards for principles for North Carolina. I fought really hard to have ethics be part of our standards. One university, and I will not name it because some of you are probably alumni, vetoed it. And so we put our own standard at Campbell. Our um, candidates have integrity as their first internship module. They have to know that integrity and ethics are where great leadership starts. You can't lose your credibility and be a good leader. So high expectations, no excuses. They're poor. They come from the other side of the tracks. Their parents don't care. When we get those children at 8 o'clock in the morning, by 4 o'clock in the afternoon, we have done our job to erase all of those barriers and limitations. We have high expectations for students, staff, teachers, administrators, central office staff, boards, parents, and most of all for communities. Um, and I'll, I'll give you some examples of that in a minute. Um, so let's start with high expectations for students. The first things first, um, Johnston County has a dress code. Um, in fact, we got slapped pretty hard because we expelled a student 
for violating the dress code and the judge told me, told not me, us, that we were violating her religious freedom because she was a member of the Church of Body Modification. You probably read about it. <laughs> but we expect students to come to school looking like they're at their job. This is their job for 13 or more years. And so they present themselves in a respectable manner. No midriffs, no cleavage. You get the, the idea. Manners. This is the stick. When I teach my students at Campbell, I use metaphors all the time. I have 15, but I didn't have time to present 15. But I wanted you to see what I do to them. I ask them to give me a metaphor for this piece of wood. And they all have one. It's different sizes, different lengths. But, and let me just take another bird, bird walk. Most husbands bring their wives chocolate and flowers. My husband brings bugs, snakes, skins, tree limbs. You get, them, you get the idea. But I taught science, and he knew I loved it. And that's, that's his way of showing me his love, and I love it. So I ask them to give me a metaphor. And as they give me the metaphor, it makes my mouth feel dirty because you'll hear why I think kind words are important. But I'll just put them down and say, and you think that's a metaphor for this? I thought you were going to work as a team. That sounds like something John Hood would say. And, and they just kind of look at me like, and I will tell you, at, at one of my classes that I did this, I had a group of veteran administrators, I mean, veteran teachers, and a first year, uh, first um, young teacher. You have to have three years teaching, but she was young. They would not let her give me their metaphor because they didn't want me screaming at her. Well, the reason I do this for them is you see this little, I don't know if you can see it from where you're sitting, but you see this little tiny vine. A little vine this big has caused this big piece of wood to twist. And I say to them, your words can twist a little soul. A teacher who rips up a piece of paper in front of a child because the work is unacceptable is unacceptable. It twists. When you throw away those ugly words to children, you twist and limit their ability to learn. What's he going to learn after you've told him he's stupid? What's he going to learn when you've told him his work doesn't measure up? Instead of saying, let me help you make it better, that's why kind words are important. <coughs> character. Johnston County has a character education program. Every month we celebrated character daily. Whatever the trait was, children learned responsibility. They learned to pick up after themselves. They learned that I didn't have a chewing gum rule, and I dare you to go to East Clayton Elementary and find one piece of gum anywhere. But I taught them how to chew it. I taught them that good character is looking after yourself and not making someone else clean up after you. Good character is saying, may I help you? Please and thank you. Good manners, just helping them develop those character and manners traits. High expectation for students, homework. Now a lot of people don't believe in homework because they're in so many activities and they're so busy or they live in a poor neighborhood and their parents can't help them. Those are excuses and we don't take excuses in high achieving schools. Homework just needs to be relevant, rigorous, and manageable. Instead of sending a child home with a worksheet, which probably doesn't get a lot of parent support, Ask him to do something relevant to his life. They're all into sports. They can do statistics. In first grade, they know how to see who won and who lost and how many games they won and how many lost and how much difference there is. Give them something re relevant and rigorous. People say, you empower children? Well, yeah. Um, part of their empowerment is the responsibility to be on time all the time. I don't want a late child to class, and I have called parents in and said, you're not only interrupting the learning of your child, but 30 or ever how many other children are in that class, your, your, your child needs to be here on time. There's a bus that comes by your door. Um, be engaged. If children track their own progress, if you say to a child, I want you to learn 100 vocabulary words, and you're, you've learned 20, 
of this particular set, we're going to put your little starting mark here, and there's 100. Imagine the joy when he gets to 40. He's doubled the number of words, and now he's almost halfway there. And when he's at 60, he's almost there. And when he gets to 100, he's achieved his goal. He's tracking his progress, and it's, it's real to him. So you empower them to, to, to track their progress. I'm a firm believer that children off the streets are children who are learning. Before and after school care activities, and I don't mean just babysitting, I mean constructive learning 24-7. I know that some um, people say, well, who's going to pay for that? Um, tutoring and activities and clubs are all part of our responsibility as a community to get those children engaged so they're not on the streets. Um, <laughs> play and have fun. Um, we had a lot of fun at East Clayton, and I could tell you some of the costumes I wore, but you probably don't want that visual image after lunch, so I will leave that out. But we had a lot of fun. And the last thing is to celebrate and recognize. I, I grew up in the era when one person got 93 awards and everybody else is sitting in the audience going, so what am I, chopped liver? I had a child who taught me this lesson my first year as a principal. I'm going to make up a name. Fred Smith. No, no, he, was, he ran for governor. Uh, and he was a Republican, so I can't say that. Um, Fred Jones. I don't know Fred Jones, so I guess it's okay. I called his name, and his award was Most Inquisitive. Now, he was sitting about six people down, and he got out and walked. You know how when you're getting out of a row of children, you face the people that you're getting out from. And his teacher was sitting on the end, and he stopped right between her legs, and he said, Miss Kennedy? I'm the baddest child in this school. And he didn't say child. He said, I'm the baddest kid in this school. And they're giving me an award. Yeah. Now, that was in fourth grade. What do you think he was like in fifth grade? He lived up to our expectations in fifth grade. And I didn't have, this, have him telling his teacher to F off in fifth grade because we gave him an award. Suddenly, he was somebody and not a bad kid. Um, Staff. Now, these are custodians, cafeteria workers, secretaries, teacher assistants, all of those people who are not teachers. First things first, they have to dress like they're going to work and not to a ball game. Good manners. I don't want to ever hear them yelling at a child. If a bus driver has a child who's doing something wrong, yelling is not going to stop it. They're going to see who can get louder. When a child gets loud, I get soft. And I teach my bus drivers and cafeteria workers when they get loud, you get soft. You don't want to model bad behavior. And so we teach them that in, in their workplace. Um, character matters, even for cafeteria and, and bus drivers. Good character. Using swear words is unacceptable, just unacceptable. In schools that are achieving schools, those words must be banned. They must be empowered to be kind, to involve themselves in decision making. I had my cafeteria worker and my head custodian and my secretary on my school improvement team. Why? Because every performance, every, every special presentation, somebody had to prepare the food and somebody had to make sure the tables were set up and the chairs were all arranged and the building was locked and unlocked and the temperature was adjusted. They needed to be at the table. What more value can they have than to be on the school improvement team? So they are involved in decision making. You give them the stuff to do their job. And then if they don't get the job done, they can go make their magic someplace else. Um, smiling bus drivers, supportive assistants, you get the idea. And this is across the board. Now, this is not just in my school, but this is across the board in successful schools. They need to tell you what they need. If, if you're an administrator and you have a custodian who needs a leaf blower, he's got to tell you. He needs a leaf blower. And then go and get it for him or her. Play and have fun. Um, some of the pranks that our custodians used to do to each other, um, they would stack all the toilet tissue that came in on one person's desk. I mean, that used fun stuff. But it kept them engaged and happy and glad to come to work because everybody was part of the team. 
And then we celebrate and recognize. Now, a lot of schools, again, will recognize the teacher of the year and the assistant of the year, and the custodians and the cafeteria workers and the bus drivers are just chopped liver. You must celebrate and recognize their contributions to learning. And I ask them all the time, Ms. Ray, what, what's your role in, in student learning? And at first, he would just look at me like, have you lost your mind? I'm not a teacher. I said, everything you do teaches. So how do you contribute to student learning? Well, I, um, I keep the bathrooms clean so they don't get sick. That was his first response. And then one day I watched him as a little autistic kindergartner was walking down the hall holding on to Mr. Ray's trash can, just way up there. You know, he's a little tiny fella. And Mr. Ray's just talking to him about how he needs to mind his teacher and how he needs to come to school every day and how glad he is to see him every day. And if he ever wants to come and help him, he will just be so happy to do that. And I called him in and I said, Mr. Ray, how do you, how do you contribute to student learning? And his face changed, but he said, because I helped Marky learn today. Yeah, you did. And he got recognized for that. We, we called him honks. Every day's daily bulletin had honks, not just from me, but from colleagues who wanted everybody to be honored and valued. Now teachers, you see these first three things? I had teachers leave my school because I said, we are not wearing jeans. We are not wearing jeans. I took it to the school improvement team, had a little battle there, and they agreed. We need to look like the professionals. We want to be treated as professionals. If we want to be treated as professionals, we need to look it so we didn't wear jeans. Um, if I ever heard a teacher yell at a child, they got, one, they got one opportunity to yell at a child. I would call them in and say, what if I yelled at you in this office? Would you, would you want to follow my leadership? Well, no. So tell me why he deserved to be yelled at and not taught. You teach first, discipline second, and punish third. I had very little punishment in my school. We taught, these teachers taught children what it was like to go to the cafeteria and carry their tray without making a mess. What to do if they made a mess. Their role was to teach first. And they had very little discipline, very little punishment. Teachers were empowered. They had to teach the curriculum every day. For those of you who aren't in education, uh, newsflash, integrated tests are based on the curriculum. So if it tells you to teach rocks and minerals and you're teaching weather, your children are probably not going to do very well. So you teach the curriculum. Um, you teach with rigor, relevance, and build relationships. That's an expectation with teachers is that they teach with rigor and relevance every day and build those relationships. Another expectation in all the successful 90-90-90 schools, my school, other successful schools, is that teachers share. It's not my school, it's our school. They participate in decision making, they use data to drive instruction. Particularly important, they involve parents. They don't call the parents and say your child's in trouble. Every teacher was expected to make contact with a note card, a phone call, or an email the first day of school. I didn't care how they did it, but that was an expectation. Once, they know, once parents know you, and you call them and you say, we've had a little problem in our classroom today, what happens? Don't you worry, I'll take care of that problem. Instead of saying, you're not going to take my child into that. A whole different, every successful school has parents who trust and back the teachers because the teachers have built relationships with parents. Every successful school. Play and have fun. Again, I could tell you about some things we did um, to have fun. It would take all day because I believed that we needed to have fun. Every teacher was recognized, every teacher, every staff member was recognized and celebrated. Now, probably what you thought when you heard that we were going to talk about great leaders was principles. Again, you see the same three things, dress, manners, and character. You can't lose your credibility and be a good principal. Principals who play funny with money, who get their honey where they make their money, lose their credibility. Y'all didn't get that, did you? Okay. Um, lose their credibility. And I will tell you, it's not a proud button, but I am proud of it. Our superintendent 
plays, but he doesn't play. The first year we were on the board, we had a principal moved in the middle of the year. He is now coaching football as a teacher. Have another one who was principal, who is now an assistant principal. If you're not going to be the leader we expect you to be, then you have to go make your magic someplace else. And you make that choice. The system doesn't make that choice. You've been coached, you've been helped, you've been sent to workshops, you've been given all the support to become a great leader, but it's up to you then to do it. And if you don't, then you have to go. Leading means setting high expectations. Here we go again. Listen and respond to the needs of schools and teachers. It's their budgets, not mine. Teachers spent every dime of money that came into our school. And then if they ran out of supplies, I would go, oh, I seem to recall that you all ordered all the stuff you needed at the beginning of the school year. Did you forget to order red construction paper knowing that Valentine's Day was coming? Then I didn't have to worry about it. It was their money. I didn't have to spend time on the throne dispensing resources. They dispense the resources. Protect instructional time. There are principals, I know you don't believe this, there are principals in this world who love a microphone and they stay on it all day and they don't even know what they're saying so long as they hear their voice. That's not being a great leader. You have to protect the instructional time. My teachers were told day one you will teach till the last day of school. Now that's changed a little bit and I don't know why. I don't know where it happened but after end of grade people think school is out. Not in our schools. Not in great schools. You teach till the last day. You have to support teachers parents as much as possible and this is what I love to say you, you support them with finances but then say yes as often as possible if you read the stories of great schools and their leaders they say yes as often as possible you defend teachers you don't let parents <coughs> abuse them you don't have parents abuse you again parents have you'll see this in a minute parents have the same expectations as teachers and children um, this is where we have failed the North Carolina and the schools in the United States. We have allowed ineffective, sometimes worse than ineffective, horrible teachers. I wish I had put the chart in here about the difference that an effective teacher makes, but we have allowed ineffective people and practices to go on and we failed our children because we have let that happen. Play and have fun, celebrate and recognize. I'm telling you, um, I have been recognized in ways that I knew I didn't deserve, but nothing was any greater honor than being the principal of a school and being a successful school. That was the greatest celebration ever. Um, parents, <coughs> if a parent came in with an attitude, I, had, I have to tell you the story. Um, had a teacher with some health issues and um, she'd been out a lot and I was working on getting her replacement. This is a true story. I know you won't believe it, but it's a true story. A parent came into the front office and said to my secretary, is Dr. Smith in? And my secretary said, yes. Uh, why? She said, I'm just going to go in there and kick butt. Okay. So she called me and <coughs> relayed the message and I said, well, do have her come in. Do have her come in. She sat down in the chair and I said, Miss Nelson, if there's any butt kicking, I'm going to do it. And I am not a butt kicker, so let's talk. This is a true story. Before she left, she had agreed to teach three days a week this week and two days a week next week. And the lady that I had been working on who said, I want to do it, but I don't want to do it full time, partnered to teach those children. That's a true story. I expect manners from parents. And you just have to say sometimes what you don't like to say to make your mouth feel dirty, but you got to say, we're going to be colleagues here. Um, we need to support parents. If they're poor, we need to empower them. If they're busy, I would go to the fire department on Saturdays so that parents could come and they always serve hot dogs on Saturday. Parents could come and talk because they work during the week. They couldn't come to school. Um, if they didn't have any transportation, these great schools, not mine, but the great schools that made a difference met at community centers where parents could walk to meet with their teachers. 
one of the most effective strategies that I've read in several of these stories is that the first day of school, the principal puts their teaching staff on a bus and rides through the district. There are still children in this North Carolina school system who have dirt floors who get their water from a well. They need to see that because you need to know where your children come from so your, your vocabulary starts where they are and then you build. Very important. Um, empowerment. Homework that they can do with their children. This means applications. Everybody has a budget for groceries. Let the children help pick out the stuff and decide which is the best buy. They can do that kind of stuff. Give them meaningful jobs to do. I've had parents who so longed to work for the school, but they worked longer hours than we were in school. A teacher would send home laminated materials and they would cut it out, feeling they had made a contribution to the classroom. Um, we'd have Saturday cleanup at the school. Um, of course, you had, I had 17,000 documented hours from the time we opened our school in January until June because we invited parents to be a part of our school. Play and have fun, celebrate and recognize. I had a page in our yearbook of volunteers who came to our school. Volunteers, parents, guest speakers were all on this page called special guests. I had more parents buy yearbooks than children because they knew their picture was going to be in the yearbook. Really. And, and that's true of, of lots and lots and lots of these schools is that you recognize the contributions of your parents and community. So finally, you have to ask for help. I wish you could read some of the stories. I, I just tell you mine because it's so fresh and recent, like 10 years ago. But um, remember I mentioned Fred Smith? Every summer when I opened my school in 1997, I would have a summer meeting and I would put our project of the year on the board and I would say, okay, what are you going to contribute? And these weren't little things like microwave oven in the cafeteria. These are 3,200 3, long fitness trails with 13 fitness stations. Fred Smith built our soccer field, baseball, the whole little play area irrigated it and cut it for three years until they built Riverwood because we asked. Another parent who remains anonymous and to this day will not let me divulge who, built four basketball goals, put up the fence around it, paved it, put the goals up because we asked. And sometimes we begged. Um, but then we celebrated and recognized them. We put up plaques that said thank you to these people where everybody who went there saw it. We gave back. Good schools, great schools, give back to those people who contribute. They're visible in the community. They play and have fun. You go to the festivals. You go to the parks. You go to places where they are, and you recognize your contributions. The second part of our beginning, remember we said the first part was um, high expectations. The second part that makes a great school is collaboration. I never read a story that I'm not impressed with the, with the principal saying, what do you think? What do you think? Ask a kindergartner, what do they think? My grandson, first grade, I wish, you know what he said? Who could have guessed this? I wish we had recess all day long. <laughs> yeah. But they have opinions. They want to be heard. I was telling Mitch about um, a, a 30 mobile unit, <laughs> my school had 30 mobile units. They needed trash cans. Second grade started the petition. You didn't get past them. And I said, well now, you know, if we buy trash cans, we're going to have to use money that comes from someplace else. They got them to sign a petition. We're willing to give up this for that. Second grade, they made brochures, they made speeches. You think that's not learning? Yeah. The staff has opinions. Um, and by the way, great schools recognize that their classified staff are really important because they live in the community, they go to church, they go to the grocery store, they belong to the Civitas, they belong to the Civitans, they belong to the Rotary, and they tote tails. So you better make sure that the tails they tote are good ones and not bad stories. So you, you really make sure that your staff are empowered. Teachers are in the trenches, they have expertise to share, they know what works. The thing we're doing to teachers is we're piling on without ever taking anything off. Great leaders take off stuff from their plates. 
And once you've asked the question, you've got to listen to their answers. If you're not going to do anything with it, don't ask. But great leaders listen to their teachers. They implement or they explain why not. It's not just because I said so. That works with a two-year-old. It does not work with adults who have given you their best. And then you must have shared vision, mission, goals, strategies, assessments, and solutions and problems, identifying problems and solutions. They have to be a part of that. The third step in the universal great schools <coughs> is love. If you don't love where you work, with whom you work, how you work, you don't love the curriculum and you don't love children, get out. You don't belong in a school. These are children. And a lot of them don't get love anywhere else. Now, I'm not talking big old frontal hugs. I'm talking about showing you care. I heard an African-American speaker last week who said in fourth grade he made his first C. He was devastated. And he went to his teacher and he said, how come I made a C? She said, because I can't read your handwriting. She kept him after school every day. And now, this day, people tell him his handwriting looks like a girl's. And you know what he said? My teacher cared and showed me she loved me by making me accountable for my work. That's what it's all about. I didn't use the A word because I figured you kind of got it. And you've got to love children. And finally, integrity. Every great administrator in every story I've read had core values. No matter spiritual values. Others may be ecological values, but they hold dear values. They have honor. They do the right thing even when no one else is looking. They apologize when they've made mistakes and they share. They don't hold the good ideas to themselves. That's my idea and you're not getting it. Well, I don't know how many of you are Christians, but you know the Bible's kind of a shared document. We plagiarize every Sunday. So I'm not opposed to sharing. So how's it done? It's done with great leaders from the classroom to the boardroom. And with that, I have one more little um, metaphor. I start my um, fall class with this jar empty, and I put this size rocks in, and I'll say, is the jar full? And they'll say, yeah, okay. Mm, maybe not, because then I put this size rock in. Is it full? Yeah. I add sand. Is it full? Yes. So then I add water. Is it full? Yes, because if we add anything else, it's going to overflow. So then I ask them, what's the metaphor? What if I'd put the water in first? Nothing else would have gone in. I have to put the big rocks, and that's what we start calling our priorities. Our big rocks have to go in first. Your first priorities have to be first. Your next priorities, your little what I call fine-tuning, and then the water to cement it all together and make a great system.